This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness affecting 40 million adults. Women are twice as likely to be affected as men. Anxiety disorders are highly treatable, yet only about 35 to 40 percent of those who suffer receive treatment. We will dive into the different types of anxiety disorders as well as ways to manage. This is Southern Remedy Women's Health from MPB Think Radio. Happy Friday, everybody. I don't know if it's anybody else, but I'm excited that uh, it is coming to the end of this week. But it was a little bit of a short week for us with the 4th of July being a holiday. So hopefully everyone enjoyed their 4th of July celebration. I am still hearing lots of fireworks in the evening. So I think a lot of people have extended their celebration throughout the week. And depending on where you are, I hope that you are being safe if it's raining um, and being careful out there and all of us if you can try to stay cool because this heat has been crazy this summer and it's hard to believe that it is only July and we are this hot so I'm really nervous about what August has to bring. But as I mentioned before, today we are going to be talking about anxiety. And this topic is really kind of near and dear to me because it is something that I am really seeing an increase in in my clinic. So many of my patients, I'm guaranteed to have several patients a day that are are dealing with some form of anxiety. Um, So before preparing for this show, I kind of wanted to look at some of the data and where we are and those types of things. So in the opening, as I mentioned, about 40 million adults are dealing with this, and that's about 19% of the population um, at some point in time in their life in general are dealing with some form of anxiety. As women, we are a lot more likely to have this problem when we compare ourselves to men as well. And it's not just a problem that we're seeing here in the United States. So I actually looked and the World Health Organization says essentially since the pandemic started, there has been a 25 percent increase in anxiety related disorders um, since the pandemic started throughout the world. So not just here um, in the U.S. or here in Mississippi, but we're really kind of seeing this everywhere. And it's understandable as we kind of dive into a little bit about what we mean about anxiety and anxiety disorder, um, that it makes sense that the pandemic has possibly caused an increase in this in general. So what? So when we think of anxiety, a lot of us kind of already have a general idea of what that means. So it's trying to differentiate between if I just have have normal kind of everyday anxiety here and there or versus having an actual disorder. So generalized anxiety disorder is an actual disorder where patients uh, deal with anxiety on a regular basis. And that is excessive and persistent worry that is difficult to control, causes significant distress or impairment and occurs on more days than not for at least six months. So essentially that almost kind of falls under what we call the textbook answer if you're trying to determine if you actually maybe just have versus, maybe I'm a little anxious here and there, versus an actual anxiety disorder that might involve, you know, more uh, directed treatment compared to then I'm a little anxious here and there. The, pro- the thing about generalized anxiety disorder is it's often associated with many more things, irritability, apprehension. And in a lot of these patients, it can have a lot of kind of physical or what we call somatic type symptoms. So 
increased fatigue, muscle tension, feeling poorly, all of that can be related to generalized anxiety disorder. And oftentimes, it's not by itself. It's often paired with other mental disorders. So a lot of times what I see in my clinic is a lot of patients are dealing with a good bit of anxiety as well as depression. And depression is kind of the most common comorbidity that we see in patients with anxiety. So a lot of times if you have some anxiety, it's not uncommon to have depression as well. So don't feel alone if you feel like you're dealing with both of those particular problems. As I mentioned, I kind of gave you the little bit of overview definition of what generalized anxiety disorder is. But when we talk about anxiety disorders, it's kind of a big umbrella of a lot of different things. So we know panic disorders. So there are some patients that have what we call like isolated panic attacks. Um, then we know there are people that have specific phobias and, and not just, you know, my husband teases me. I'm terrified of a bug that, you know, might be the size of a dime will make me run out of the room. That's not what I'm talking about phobias, but these are people that have debilitating symptoms um, when they're in those particular particular situations. And then, of course, like your um, social phobias, those who have problems with presentations um, or get very anxious when they're in particular group settings, um, that it's debilitating that they oftentimes avoid those situations. So there's lots of different um, anxiety type disorders that many patients can deal with in general. So as I, anytime I talk about a topic, why is it important? So some people are like, I'm anxious or, you know, something like that. So why is it important if I'm feeling that way? So generalized anxiety disorder has a lot of other things that oftentimes goes along with it. So oftentimes people with generalized anxiety can have increased rates of alcohol use or substance disorders. And oftentimes people are just trying to treat um, their symptoms of anxiety with those types of things. We also see lots of patients with anxiety that might have post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. So those types of things are often associated with anxiety. And something else that we see is a lot of our patients that deal with generalized anxiety often have worsening of their other chronic medical problems. So a lot of my patients, if we're not treating their anxiety well, they might have worsening of their arthritis pain or other chronic pain, chronic back pain, um, or, you know, rheumatoid toward arthritis or those types of symptoms. So we know that having anxiety on top of that can worsen some of the other things that we have. So that's why it's really important for us to be able to identify if we're dealing with an anxiety disorder and hopefully seek treatment. There's also even some studies, and not surprising, because I tell patients all the time, our grandparents may have gotten it right when they say you can worry yourself sick. That's a real thing. So there's a lot of emerging studies, again, not consistent, but that anxiety can increase our blood pressure. It can increase our heart rate. It can increase our risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's even some newer studies coming out seeing a potential increased risk of dementia. And so, again, this is not set in stone. There's not studies that, unfortunately, are consistently showing it each way. But these are definitely some things that you might read in some articles when you're reading about anxiety of those types of things. So as we talk about anxiety in general, you know, a lot of people are like, my mom was anxious, my grandma was anxious, th therefore I am anxious. So there is a lot of things that do show that there is a potential genetic component to anxiety. So a strong family history of mom or sister or aunt or uncle or someone that deals with anxiety, you are at increased risk of possibly dealing with anxiety. Other things that we see, uh, people who are sometimes um, at risk, as I mentioned, women in general, we're oftentimes at higher risk. And, you know, in medicine, we're always trying to find the why. So there are a lot of studies that are trying to look at, um, is there a different in, difference in the brains of people that have more anxiety? So there are emergent studies that show that if you take the MRIs of brains of patients with anxiety disorder versus without anxiety disorder, there may be some subtle differences that we see in different areas of the brain. So we have so much to learn about anxiety in general, but we do know that there is a potential genetic component to it, but there's still so much more to learn about that in general. 
oftentimes most people start to see anxiety around the age of 30 um, is kind of when we kind of sometimes see that present later onset 50 or greater um, you can see that as well but less likely when we get a lot older interestingly enough over 65 or so tend to be less likely to deal with anxiety so so some positives in aging out there and we are noticing of course and you guys are probably seeing this on the news and social media and everything that anxiety disorders oftentimes have onset in childhood and in adolescence so there's actually um, an average age for children around the age of 11 that we're really starting to see um, more anxiety present um, in our pediatric population so again we can see anxiety at all ages um, sometimes a little bit younger but mostly around the age 30 or so that we're seeing um, anxiety be a real issue for many people there are other factors too that can of course increase anxiety which is not surprising um, so those risk factors are socioeconomic status so of course um, sometimes having lower income would of course make us more anxious we're worried about paying our bills, we're worried about where our food's coming from, how our family's going to do. So not surprising. There also are other psychosocial factors um, that can affect anxiety, even marital status, whether you're being widowed or divorced, increased risk, stressful life events. And as I mentioned before, again, just kind of substance abuse, smoking, alcohol, those types of things go along with it as well. So not only do I want you guys to call with your questions about anxiety, I also also love to hear about your experiences and maybe some treatment options that have worked for you that may not have necessarily worked for others because I definitely think um, when we talk about anxiety is definitely not a one size fits all kind of situation. So what do I do? I feel I'm hearing this story. I'm feeling like I'm anxious. I don't know if I'm just anxious now, if I'm dealing with actual anxiety disorder. So how do we figure it out? What does my doctor do? So and, uh, right now, the United States Preventive Task Force actually recommends that your providers actually screen you for anxiety disorder. And so sometimes it may not seem very form formal as we're asking you guys, how is your day? How have things been? How are the kids? How's life? So sometimes we're kind of screening you for anxiety when we're just trying to get a general idea of your mood. But the task force actually recommends that we screen between the ages of 19 and 65. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you're a little bit older than 65, we aren't quite seeing that as much. But for adults between the ages of 19 to 65 is typically when we screen. Um, and now, as I mentioned, we are seeing it more in children. The uh, AAP actually recommend, and that's our American Academy of Pediatrics, actually recommend screening for anxiety as well between the ages of 17 and 18 when your kids are coming in for their checkup. So I tell patients, even though your child's doing okay and you don't really have a whole lot of questions, please come to your kids' checkups because we not only are looking at their growth and their blood pressure and things like that, but we're also checking in on them and their mood um, and kind of going uh, from there. So as we talk about, you know, kind of generalized anxiety disorder and screening, we actually have a screening tool that we use. And that is the general, that is called the GAD-7. So that's the generalized anxiety disorder scale. And so that's oftentimes what your doctor may use um, when they are trying to diagnose, diagnose you with not only um, anxiety disorder, but trying to quantify the um, the um, the how severe your anxiety disorder is. So the generalized anxiety disorder scale essentially looks at seven different questions. That's why it's called the GAD seven. So they'll ask you things about how about feeling nervous and anxious, not um, is your anxiety so significant that you're not able to stop or control your worrying? Do you worry too much about different things? Do you have trouble relaxing? And how are you restless? Are you annoyed and irritable? Are you afraid? So it's these seven different steps and they ask you how you feel about that over the past two weeks and you rate it on a scale of zero to three and based off of that number, that's how we essentially de determine um, what your uh, level of anxiety is in general. And so, um, that is essentially how we kind of 
decide on generalized anxiety disorder within the clinic. So when we talk about screening, they can use that scale. There's also another like postnatal depression scale that can be used for our postpartum patients. Um, And then there's also a geriatrics anxiety scale that your doctor may use as well when looking at anxiety. So the other things that we kind of look at in general, too, when we're talking about anxiety is not just looking at talking to you, but oftentimes physical exam can give us other kind of, of things that we're looking into. Is your heart rate up? Do you seem anxious when you're in the room when we're talking to you? Just your physical kind of demeanor while you're there in the clinic. That can also help kind of point us in the direction of sometimes if our patients are, are appearing more more anxious than they have before. Now, as I mentioned before, I gave you kind of a general idea of what generalized anxiety disorder is. But like with anything else in medicine, there is a clear cut criteria. So if you're talking to a psychiatrist, um, we have what we call the DSM-5, and that's essentially diagnostic scales that we use that determine if the patient fits exactly into that criteria of anxiety disorder. And so that you can always look up, but the kind of overall gist of that is, again, as I mentioned before, excessive anxiety and worry for at least six more days than not over the past six months and typically happen at more than one location, work, school, home, individual finds it difficult to control their worry, their anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following things, restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances. And so if you check so many boxes, then your doctor might give you the official diagnosis of what we call generalized anxiety disorder. As I mentioned before, though, there are things that can look like anxiety that aren't necessarily anxiety. So as a doctor, we call those our differential diagnosis. So as I mentioned before, depression. So you might be more feeling more depressed down, low, you know, depressed mood, no interest in doing things versus excessive worry. So that's kind of how we oftentimes as doctors try to differentiate between the two. But as I mentioned before, it's not uncommon to have both things. Panic disorder. So there are patients that may not have generalized anxiety disorder that they're worrying every day or most days, but they have specific situations where they get extremely anxious. And so that goes along with the panic disorder. However, what I do want patients to remember is, to me, oftentimes, anxiety in a panic attack is a diagnosis of exclusion. So that means that I've ruled out other things that are causing your symptoms. So I never want patients to be like, oh, my heart's racing and I'm sweating because I'm having a panic attack. You need to be talking to your doctor about that because sometimes um, heart dysrhythmias can present like this. So patients that might have atrial fibrillation and they're feeling their heart rate or they're feeling very anxious, sometimes that can be a presenting symptom. Sometimes people with risk factors for heart disease can be having a heart attack. As we've mentioned in the past, women with don't always have chest pain. Um, we have a typical presentation. So it could be, you know, that it could be a tightness in your chest. It could be a sweating. It could be the racing and you're feeling very anxious and worried. And I've had some patients brush that off as a panic disorder or anxiety attack. So it's something you definitely need to be talking to your doctor about and not necessarily brushing off as a panic attack or anxiety and making sure you're seeking treatment. Other things that look that can make a person more anxious or look like they're having anxiety are people whose often thyroid levels are off. So hyperthyroidism, meaning you have an overactive thyroid, can oftentimes make patients more anxious or feel more anxious or have the heart racing or, you know, and you can have excessive worry about your health that can be related to your thyroid hormone being off. So those are other things as doctors that we consider when we're working patients up for anxiety disorders. 
Um, other things that you definitely, you know, can can look at some patients could be anemic. Um, you know, it could be a medication that you're taking that makes you feel more anxious or things of that nature. So all of those things can be related to anxiety. So that's why, you know, any Friday that I'm on this radio show, I always tell you, make sure you're talking to your doctor and um, looking at what is going on with you, because all of this is not necessarily a one size fits all. Well, looks like we have our um, first caller here. We have Greg Biloxi. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm doing good now. Uh, when I quit cigarettes, I started getting an anxiety attacks. Uh, they were, the last one was <clears throat> was really severe. I was wondering if uh, medicine or food-induced and anxiety attacks are, are you saying, are there some medicines that can cause you to be more anxious? Yeah, yeah. Yes. When, I, when, I, when nicotine withdrawal, it, it got me. I mean, the last one was so bad. I, I had to lay down and I used a stethoscope to listen to my heartbeat, and that, and that kind of calms me down. Yes, sir. So you bring up an excellent point. So a lot of our patients, sometimes our medications that we use to help treat anxiety, if patients stop them abruptly, you need to be weaned from them. Um, they can essentially give you feelings of anxiety, essentially heart racing, all those things. Patients that are stopping smoking, congratulations. I really ho want you, if you quit, congrats. And if you're working on please don't give up. But you're right. If you're stopping smoking and those, you know, withdrawal from your nicotine can also make you feel extremely anxious as well. Caffeine. So people, you know, drink a lot of their coffee, oftentimes get too much coffee, can make give you symptoms of um, anxiety. The loaded teas that a lot of patients drink sometimes have a lot of caffeine. And so I've actually had some patients that have felt more anxious or jittery or those types of things, even if they're having excessive amounts of caffeine, not just a loaded teas, but even like your energy drinks. Um, as well. So you're right. There are some if you've got foods loaded with caffeine, um, if you are, you know, coming off of medications um, that are required to be weaned um, in the, even our benzos. So, you know, Xanax or um, Ativan, those types of things. If you abruptly stop them, you can get symptoms of feeling anxiety or anxious. Um, so you're right. All those things really can contribute to anxiety. OK, uh, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have a great Friday. And so as I mentioned before, I think that's kind of a great spot to go ahead and kind of jump in a little bit into the management of anxiety disorders. So, you know, you've gone to your doctor, you think you might be anxious, you guys kind of talk about it, or they screen you for it and it comes up in conversation, you know, and you kind of, kind of figure out that you might be um, dealing with an anxiety disorder. So how do we treat it? And as I mentioned before, it's not necessarily a kind of one size fits all situation. So it falls into what I call with my patient shared decision making, making. So just because you have anxiety does not necessarily mean that you have to be on a medicine. Um, as I mentioned before, we use that scale, the GAD-7, to help determine the severity of your symptoms. So sometimes my patients that might just have mild symptoms, it might just be, hey, you know, we know you're dealing with a little bit of anxiety, but let's just watch it for now and kind of see how things go. Um, and some people are okay with that. And sometimes it can be very situational. You're going through something stressful in life. And so, you know, maybe that that big project that do that's due at work is going to be over next week. And then, you know, your symptoms essentially resolve. So it's a very, it, there's a very vast way to treat it. So there's the non-medicine. So we have medicines that we can use. And then we can ultimately look at something that we call cognitive behavioral therapy. So some patients may benefit from therapy alone. Some patients may benefit from medicine. And some patients may benefit from a combination of both. From MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. Today, we have been talking about anxiety disorder, mainly because it's one of the most common mental illnesses um, that we see among people, particularly women that I see in my clinic. And so far, we have just gotten a chance to dive in a little bit about what is generalized anxiety disorder 
disorder, what things look like generalized anxiety disorder or can mimic them. And then now we're just really taking the opportunity to dive a little bit into what are our treatment options for patients that may be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. So as I mentioned before, before going into the break, Trying to decide when to treat for generalized anxiety disorder is very patient dependent, and it's not a one size fits all kind of category. So there are some patients that don't necessarily require treatment at all. It, it, their symptoms are very mild. It is not necessarily debilitating. Um, they feel, for the most part, most days they're able to function without a problem. So those might be patients that I say, you know, I think it's fair that we watch it. I understand you may not have time for therapy and you're not necessarily interested in starting a medication, um, but it's something that we'll just kind of keep a close eye on. So the big two categories for oftentimes treating anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety disorder is cognitive behavioral therapy. And essentially that is kind of reasoning exercises or real experience kind of uh, scenarios that help facilitate symptom reduction and essentially improve function. So a lot of times, uh, you know, the beauty of What's happened since the pandemic's happened is a lot of therapy is now available without you having to go in person to make that happen. So there's so many virtual telehealth options, online options, you know, for you that even have, uh, you know, allow you to do phone calls, do video calls through your phone without having to physically go to a therapist's office to get those services. So cognitive behavioral therapy pretty much teaches you what to do when you're having those episodes of excessive worry or excessive thoughts that in some patients stop you from being able to function. So it teaches you what to do when you feel that way, you know, whether it's breathing techniques, um, you oftentimes will go through different scenarios and different kind of mindful ways to address when you're having those particular symptoms. So that's what cognitive behavioral therapy is. And I tell most patients, they're like, how long am I going to have to do this? It really just depends. But for the most part, you can look at probably minimum about 10 to 15 sessions. And that is going to depend on what your symptoms are like. And again, the severity of your symptoms, the progress that you're making, and essentially your relationship in general with your therapist that you're seeing. Now, one thing I will say is I try to tell people don't try to make a decision after one visit or one therapy session, because as you know, some people feel a little bit uncomfortable on that first therapy session, or oftentimes your therapist is trying to just get to know you in general. So I feel like it's hard to make a really good impression after that first therapy session. So I try to tell patients to give it a good, you know, three or so therapy sessions before you've really made your mind up about your relationship with that therapist and moving forward. But looking at it realistically, you're looking at about 15 or so sessions of this cognitive behavioral therapy to hopefully start seeing um, some in general improvement in your symptoms. Looks like we have a caller, Wyatt in Hazelhurst, with us this morning. Good morning, Wyatt. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm good. What's your question this morning? Uh, it's, it's sort of a broad question. Okay. Uh, is, you know, in Mississippi, we're often, you know, thought of as, you know, oh, they're, you know, we're laid back, you know, uh, sort of, um, you know, relaxed people. But when you think about as great as our state is, with what our state struggles with in relation to um, exposure to poverty, exposure to crime, exposure to uh, maternal death, exposure to uh, infant mortality, um, poor access to health care, uh, numerous natural disasters. It would seem like actually it's a state, like we're primed to get people to uh, be prone to the experience of generalized anxiety. Uh, and I just didn't uh, wanted to see your thoughts about how, as great as the state is, some of the things we struggle with our state on a broad level for all of us may make us more prone to experience anxiety. 
No, I think you're definitely you definitely have a great point there, because as I mentioned before, you know, we know that a lot of even just with the pandemic in general, the increase in anxiety across the board because people losing their job, uh, access to health care, all of those things were significantly impacted by the pandemic. So you're exactly right. A lot of the things that our state has gone through definitely does put us at significant risk of anxiety disorder um, and other their mental illnesses. And I think we lost Wyatt there, but th- thank you so much for your comment. But I definitely, you know, think that's important to highlight why I'm hoping that many people are listening, that if you yourself are having, you know, problems with anxiety or, you know, a family member, that you're making sure that it's something that you're bringing up with your provider. Because honestly, oftentimes a lot of my patients don't want to talk about it. And I'm a really nosy doctor. So I not only just want to know what how your blood pressure is doing, but I usually want to know how your family's doing, how you're doing, how work is going. And oftentimes I don't get to the anxiety piece until I really kind of pull it out of patients. So I do have some patients that won't come in and say, hey, you know what, Dr. Kinsey, I'm anxious. It is something they'll kind of beat around the bush about. So I'm hoping that, you know, this conversation empowers you when you have your next checkup with your doctor. If you if you're concerned that you're experiencing some symptoms of anxiety, that you're making sure that you're having that conversation with them, Um, because we have so many, you know, resources and things that we can do to offer you help. And as I mentioned before, oftentimes having anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder can exacerbate so many more of the chronic medical problems that our patients have. I've had some patients come in you know, with worsening pain. And, you know, sometimes we can't pinpoint exactly what happened. But when I kind of dive into it, you know, we are more stressed, we are more anxious. And so sometimes addressing that can really help us in general. So as I mentioned before, cognitive behavioral therapy has shown to show great success in patients that ultimately stick with it over half of the patients um, that get into therapy, see significant improvement in their symptoms is what studies show. In addition to that, the thing that I think most of my patients are most hesitant about and worried about is taking a medicine for anxiety. So there are many of my patients that I talk to that I have to say, hey, you know, this is causing you significant distress. And what we've done so far is not working. So the biggest question I get when it comes to medication is, am I going to be on this for life? Usually not. And again, it is a case by case basis. But sometimes, you know, we have some hard times in life that we need a little bit of help. So if therapy is not necessarily an option for you, so many studies have shown that patients that seek treatment through medication are able to have significant improvement of their symptoms as well. So usually when we're looking at first-line medication for anxiety, it's oftentimes the medicine that you hear a lot of patients talk about called SSRIs or SNRIs. And so across the board, they are the first line because A, we know they work, and they're less loss, less likely to cause sedation or cognitive side effects that we often see with other, other antidepressants, such as benzos like Xanax or Ativan, um, or even our TCAs, our patients on amitriptyline or Elevil or things of that nature that you hear. Um, so what is an SSRI? That is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What it does is it increases the levels of serotonin in your brain. Serotonin essentially is what we call a neurotransmitter or a chemical in the brain that sends different messages to your brain cells. So what this medicine does is it blocks the uptake of that kind of serotonin and makes it hang out a little bit longer. And for a lot of patients, that can help with our mood. So I try to remind my patients, this is not a happy pill. You're not going to take this medicine and all our feelings or symptoms essentially melt away. SSRIs and SNRIs, so SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And the difference in SSRI or SNRI is one is just serotonin and then one is serotonin and increase in norepinephrine. So in 
all in all, you know, work pretty similarly. So these are the medications that you hear about, like uh, when you hear patients say, I'm on citalopram or Celexa, escitalopram, Lexapro, sertraline or Zoloft. That's a very common one. Paroxetine is Paxil. Um, you'll hear a lot of people that are on um, fluoxetine. Prozac is another very common one that falls in that category. And then that's SSRIs. And then our SNRIs, you'll hear people on Cymbalta or Deloxetine is the other name for that. Um, and then Lefaxin or Effexor is another SNRI. So these medications, as I talk about, kind of, you know, increase the serotonin or, you know, happy neurotransmitter that helps in your body that in general, in general, can help with your mood with anxiety. As I mentioned before, it's not a happy pill. I tell patients to think of it more of a, as a medication that takes the edge off. So if you're just, you know, if your anxiety level is on a 10, my hope with the medication is I might be able to bring you down to a five. I can't guarantee you a zero, you know, because life happens and life is stressful. But I also don't want you walking around at a 10 every day. So if we can find a way to essentially take the edge off. So how do I ultimately know what medication is right for me? So SSRIs, I just listed a whole list of them for you. So it's really going to be patient by patient. And it's oftentimes has to do with a side effect profile. So some of those medications might be more likely to um, cause difficulty sleeping, while some might make you more sleepy. So if I have a patient that is having issues with sleep and are anxious, I might do Siltalopram or Celexa. That's one that has a lower risk of causing you some insomnia. Same thing for Lexapro. If I have a patient, for example, that might be dealing with chronic pain or chronic back pain or things like that, I might pick, pick an anti-anxiety medicine like Cymbalta or Duloxetine because not only does that medicine help with anxiety, it also has a second indication where it can help with pain as well. So it's not, again, a one size fits all when picking these medications for our patients. It's really going to be based on your particular other health problems or other symptoms that you may be having that can ultimately help us decide what medicine might be helpful for you in treating your anxiety. Then the question I get a lot is, why not? Usually I have patients come in that have anxiety and they have been on um, Xanax or Ativan or things like that in the past. Why aren't those first line? And again, it's because we know the potential of dependence down the road. Um, so that's usually why it's not one of the ones your doctors may be offering you. We're not wanting our patients to be miserable. We're not trying to withhold any medications from you. We're not accusing you uh, um, of anything. It's just the science does not support the long term use of medications like that. So when are medications like that used? When you have a situation, you know, if you've lost, you've already got anxiety, you've lost a loved ones, you're unable to work each day, you're unable to take care of your kids, and we need immediate relief in your symptoms, that might, you're a person where I say, okay, we're going to, you know, maybe do Xanax or Ativan for a week or a couple of weeks until our SSRIs or SNRIs kick in, because those usually can take about two to four weeks before we really see improvement in symptoms. So... Um, and we are going to go ahead and move on to our next caller. I have Alicia in Ocean Springs. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. So tell me your question. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on um, whenever you start to treat your patients. If you do the genetic testing, um, some of them, I, like one of the brand names, I think it's like Genocide or something mm -hmm. like that, to see if they're genetically you know, if they're the medication they're taking or the one you're going to prescribe is appropriate for their genes. Thank you so much for that question, Alicia. So for our listeners out there that's not quite sure what Alicia's talking about. So you're right. The, the most common one that I saw that I had a lot of my patients do was the genocide. And so there is genetic testing that you can do for antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, and even patients on ADHD medication that you send a sample off to. And they look at which med look at your kind of genetic profile. And based on that, kind of give you a green, a yellow or a red green, meaning it's a medication that's good for you, should work for you, based off of how your genetics are composed. Yellow, maybe, and red is probably one that you should ultimately avoid. So, you know, Alicia, it's a tough one because I don't know that a lot of insurance companies cover that for my patients. So um, 
A, you have to look at the cost. If it's something that's free of charge, it's something that I say, hey, it's not harmful for us to get that genetic testing and look at it to see where we can start. But as I mentioned before, that genetic testing also isn't looking at all the other things I mentioned, like, you know, if you're having insomnia, if you have chronic pain or some other things that we look at that help us determine what's a good medicine for a patient. But I think it's okay if your insurance covers it. I wouldn't necessarily do it out of pocket. And the reason I say that is because with the SSRIs and SNRIs, it really is trial and error, taking the medication and seeing which one works for you with the minimal side effects. So I will be honest, it really was a coin toss. My patients that got that test, I had some that were spot on and I had some that weren't. Um, So I don't know the actual statistics behind it, but if you're going to be paying out of pocket for that, I I probably would not do it. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much. No problem. You take care, Alicia. Thanks. So, so Alicia brings up a great point. So, how do we? So, I told you a little bit about how um, we go about deciding what medication may work for you, but it's still trial and error. So, for us, you want the medication that is most effective and the one that's going to cause the least amount of side effects. And we don't know that honestly until we try it. Um, and so, a lot of patients, you know, will try the medication and have great success. You know, we often start you at the lowest dose. Um, if your if your symptoms are great great and your mood is great and you have minimal side effects, a lot of my patients, I will keep at that dose and use the lowest effective dose. Let's say we start you on the low dose. You're not really seeing much improvement. You're not having a lot of side effects. Then we would titrate your, titrate your dose up to the higher dose until we essentially reach a good point for you. If you're having a lot of side effects, sometimes it might be that we need to decrease the dose or we need to try a medication, a different medication in general. And again, that's going to be on a case by case basis. And I get so many patients, I tell them right from the beginning, please be patient with me. It may take some time for us to find the medication that works best for you. So I get a lot of patients that come in and say, you know, my sister is on, um, you know, Zoloft and it works great for her. And we put them on it and it doesn't. And so they get disappointed. But I try to remind them that you are different, even though it is your sister. Um, So finding the right combination for you. The other worry becomes, you know, I started this medicine, Dr. Kinsey, we're at the highest dose. I feel better, but I'm not quite where I need to be. So there are situations where we may consider adding an additional medication to to the current one you're on. And that, again, is a case by case basis. The other question I get a lot is, when do I need to see a psychiatrist? When, you know, a lot of us in primary care, whether it's internal medicine, family medicine, um, your OBGYN that you're seeing, whoever your primary care doctor are, most of us are pretty comfortable with starting patients on medications for the anxiety or getting them referred um, to a psychologist or a clinic or somewhere where you can get therapy services. Usually when I have patients that we've tried several different different medications, they're not having a lot of great success, um, or, you know, we're on the highest doses of some of the medicines and we've added an additional medicine and we're still not getting where we need to be. Oftentimes, that's when I phone a friend, I get a psychiatrist on board and get my patients referred. As I mentioned before, there might be some patients that have more than one thing going on or other mental disorders, such as not just anxiety, but you're dealing with anxiety, depression, maybe some PTSD or other disorders. So oftentimes in those patients that have several things going on, I may send to a psychiatrist and other patients where the diagnosis may not be complete completely clear um, for me, I might send to a psychiatrist as well. So if you have anxiety, it doesn't automatically mean that you have to get in with a psychiatrist. Many times your primary care provider can help you get the resources or start on um, start you on some medications as well. Medicine and therapy aren't always the only options. Don't forget yoga is a wonderful, you know, exercise can definitely help with mood, help with stress, help with anxiety, you know, all the other things outside of medicines, massage therapy, aromatherapy. Um, There are some, you know, you know, people that lavender, chamomile, lemon balm, valerian root. There are some herbal options. We've talked about these before on, you know, kind of my supplement segment. There are some other 
herbal options that can help with anxiety as well. But again, make sure you're talking with your doctor um, about your symptoms before starting anything, especially looking at your other health problems and other medications that you may have been on. Well, I definitely have enjoyed talking with you guys today about anxiety, and I hope that it encourages you to talk to your provider as well. This is Southern Remedy Women's Health. It's a production of the Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and it's funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and generous support from listeners like you. Today's show was engineered by Jay White. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey. Join us next Friday at 11 for Southern Women's Health on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.